We left the last workroom video having learned a little about what the early workroom, which I call the design arm, did and what Betty Sykes and Christine Edwards, as well as the later workroom girls said about the type of sewing tasks they did then. We're going to start using some of the language that the workroom girls use from now onwards. So if you're not sure what a toile is, pop back and listen to workroom two, where we explain what that means. To recap for a moment, there were two distinct phases in the way the workroom operated. The design arm, where they designed and made clothes from 1938 until about 1950, then afterwards and overlapping with the design arm, alterations until it closed in 1978. We'll talk about alterations in another workroom video. Follow the pink dots on the map of the locations you see here to find out where each of Mirelle's workrooms were. The larger the dot, the longer the time they stayed there and they show their importance also using space inside or around each of the locations they called home. The Church Institute was the longest of about 30 years between around 1941 and the end of 1970. We'll talk through where each of the workrooms were in a separate video, so don't forget to subscribe as it's coming up soon. Mira had a lot of workroom staff in the peak of the design arm, which was around 1946 when this picture was taken and one woman, Eileen Goodlass, had a big part to play in giving us all a picture of what it was like immediately after the war until 1950 when the design arm making clothes for clients fell out of use in favour of the ready to wear and wholesale couture clothes that Mira bought in for sale. You can hear about that in the showroom videos and the fashions coming up, but there's a bit of fashion history in our location talks too. Betty Sykes told us about the pre-war period from opening and eventually she left in 1945, but Eileen tells us what it was like immediately afterwards. Here she is. Number four, standing with the rest of her colleagues in a picture taken on the snowy steps of the Church Institute on Albion Street. She was probably around 15 when she started at Mirel, in late 45 going on 46, she said. And although this sort of weather isn't unusual in a wintry East Yorkshire, the way the girls are hugging themselves in the cold air, as well as the trousers Winnie Sadler, Ethel Duffin and the headscarf Jean Broughton's wearing suggests it could have been the bitter winter of 1946 to 7, one of the coldest on record, like the Big Freeze of 1963. Eagle eyed fashion detectives amongst you will have also noticed that it's a very good snapshot of what women wore every day or in the working environment. Trousers and turbans very much lasting because clothes rationing was still going on and would take another four years to finish. In 1945 to six, when Eileen posed with her workmates, clothes rationing points were scarce cut to 24 in the last year of the war and people wore what was still in their wardrobes even if they made their own clothing which also cost points in buying the fabric to create. The workroom girls would have known how to draft their own patterns though as you'll hear in the other workroom videos. The trousers and plain clothes Shoulder length hair tied back and knitted jumpers you see here were a wartime trend which you'll find out about in the fashions as well. In the locations we talk about the Church Institute on Albion Street and Mr Jackson, the caretaker who lived in the basement, took this photo. So if you haven't watched the locations already, scroll and find out more. As they stood and smiled and the shutter went click. 
Next door to the left of their sight line would have been the burned out carcass of the Congregational Church. The ruins of the Royal Institution close to number 6 Albion Street further down the street if they glance that way. Gaps all round Hull from the Blitz like broken teeth. Totally different from the Hull of today. We see them in front of the Institute steps, a building that miraculously survived when all round was bombed or damaged. A notice saying, meeting rooms for hire on the right. And they continued to have a workroom there until December 1970, perhaps still in the same studio, Studio 5, and hiring it then. We'll hear more about the workrooms coming up, so don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon. The range of skills of the workroom hands also explains what sewing tasks they were expected to carry out, i.e. what was coming in from the showroom and what was being designed and made. We know from details of a fashion show in March 1946, as well as Eileen's recollections, and the designs of Christine Edwards in 47 and 48, that these women did make clothes at this time. However, they also altered ready-to-wear clothing, that's already made clothes, that were bought in for sale in the showroom from large brands like Spectator Sports. Handling alterations, sometimes shortened to the word alts, was a specific role in the workroom. They didn't all have the same skills. So let's go through what each woman was employed to do from the top row and learn a little bit about who they were as well. Ready to meet them all? Let's go. Number one was Edna Swain, an alteration hand, a job you'll hear about more in videos coming up. She did Eileen's dark wavy hair one day, putting it up in pins and it looked lovely, Eileen said. Number two, the tall lady at the top with dark hair was Miss Myland, who was a tailoress. You'll remember that this was a different job, working with different fabrics and styles from a dressmaker. Miss Myland was the head of the workroom. Eileen also used the feminised way of describing her, as did other workroom girls, in a sign of respect and a point of difference from male tailors, and was the word also used in job adverts, tailoress wanted, rather than tailor. It would be 30 years later, in 1975, after the Sex Discrimination Act came into being, that gender was not able to be included in job adverts as it was in 1946 until then. Miss Myland was the girl's boss and looked at each sewing task before allocating it and they'd work under her watchful gaze, a system that lasted right until Mirelle's closure in 1978, long after Mildred Walker became workroom head. You met her in other workroom talks. Miss Myland and the other tailoresses' skills, doing what later workroom girls called heavy work, meant sewing heavyweight fabrics like tweeds and woolens, the sort of sewing tailors did to construct men's suits and were employed or worked all over Hull doing the same. Miss Myland and the other Morel tailoresses worked on the tightly fitted suits of the 40s, waists emphasised with calf length straight skirts before Christiane Dior's new look changed styles only a few months after this photo was taken in February 1947. Standing below Miss Myland is Mary Day at number three. Mary was an alteration hand as well as Edna and is unusual in the workroom because she was still there in 1957, which we'll see in a picture coming up in another video, so don't forget to subscribe. Mary then worked all the way through the lifetime of Mirelle and was there in 1978 when Janet Webster, who we've mentioned in the second workroom talk, was there too. Mary had as much longevity as Mira, 
much longer than Molly. And although Eileen was laid off after a situation that left her bitter, well into her 80s, she returned and worked alongside Mary, developing her skills. Eileen is number four. Dark haired and slender with wavy hair, wearing a V-neck jumper to keep warm. She didn't expect to be in this picture as she was no good at sewing, she admitted freely with a chuckle. She left school in the summer holidays of 1945, aged 14, and worked in a shop. Her aunt eventually, and with some question as to why, getting her an interview when Mira advertised to fully staff the workroom and expand it immediately after the war. Inside 60 King Edward Street, Mira examined a dress she told her she'd made very closely, looking at the evenness of stitches and the quality of the work before offering her the apprenticeship, which you'll remember was a training position being taught by the workroom staff. It was long afterwards when her friend Shirley joined her there after this picture was taken Shelley was very, very good at sewing, but Eileen admitted it had been made by her. Eileen flourished though and became a dressmaker, saying she could also tailor clothes by the end of her time at Mirale. In around 1952, working at Thornton Varley's workroom afterwards, they'd have been really glad of her experience as Mirale had a very exclusive reputation by then with what was called fine sewing work. Number five, Audrey Gray, was an alteration hand and improver, which means not an apprentice any longer, the next step up, and she was a dressmaker, someone who could tackle just about anything in soft flowing fabrics, making up patterns, which was an essential part of the clothes making process, and Betty Sykes did in the beginning as well, which we learned about in the earlier workroom talks. Number six was Ivy Manthorpe, who was an Jehovah's Witness and lived down Strawberry Gardens over the River Hull in the east of the city, said Eileen, and was really lovely, she thought. Having nice people in the workroom was important as it made the working day go faster and people helped each other, especially when they were learning new tasks. The workroom their only place of work. In later talks, we'll look at where the workrooms were in Hull and hear about them through the eyes of the workroom girls. So don't forget to subscribe to here when that's coming up. Number seven was Joan Chittenden, an alteration hand who worked her way up to be a fitter. The job specific to adjusting clothes to fit that we talked about in the second workroom talk. Despite them sitting round the same table, she wasn't one of Eileen's favourite people. While they were in the Percy Street workroom in around 1948, a tight and cramped space Eileen was not fond of going there temporarily after the Church Institute was being renovated, Joan told Mira that Eileen had been tittle-tattling, gossiping, in other words, about the clients, that is, and Eileen was promptly summoned and then sacked by Mira only to return again sometime later on, after threading beads for a job instead. Eileen hadn't been tittle-tattling, she knew she hadn't, and it was only time passing that another option presented herself, that it was an excuse because there wasn't enough work for her to do, a legitimate reason for an employer to lay someone off as it was known, and nothing to do with the accusations of gossip at all. As you can see, the sort of things that happened in workplaces the world over also happened at Mirelle, and they got to know each other too. But there, if you were caught gossiping about the clients that were coming into the showroom or did something to offend them, it was enough to be sacked, as old Gaffey found out in 1954. Check out our showroom talks to meet Olga there and find out where she ended up. Spoiler, it wasn't Hull. Number eight was Alteration Hand Norma, who you see in the overalls, what Eileen called the light tan coat she's wearing over the top of her clothes. 
It was a way of protecting her everyday clothing and also the clothes they were working on, a bit like chef's whites. They didn't have to wear them, but could if they wanted to, said Eileen. Norma travelled to Hull on the Lincoln Castle steamboat across the Humber's ruddy waters from Barton on the opposite shore in Lincolnshire and perhaps she felt she needed extra protection from its coal-fired smut and smoke every day. The other ladies lived in or around Hull. Eileen travelled into Paragon Station each day for work from outside Hornsey, the seaside town on the northeast coast. Paid only £9.08 and eightpence a week, about £300 in the present day. She said it made the train fares more than her wages and her dad had to sub her the rest. The workroom staff were not paid commission, unlike the showroom girls, and despite costing up alterations or dressmaking according to time and complexity, their wages were a flat rate each week. On the bottom row, number nine, was Miss Allen, a family name well known in Hull for running a demolition business. And although we can't be sure she was from those Allens, whose name was painted in black and white, presiding over some of its post-war ruins, someone unconnected with the workroom in the present day suggested that as an Allen who is a relation of hers, moved to Australia. She might have been the owner of the Australian wedding dress. We'll cover this dress in a separate video, but in the meanwhile, go to House of Morel UK and type in Australia into the search bar and you can find out a bit more about it there. You can also subscribe there for updates. Miss Allen was a fitter. The job specific to making clothes fit a client we talked about in the second workroom video and having two on the team shows you how much work was coming in. And number 10 was Winnie Sadler, a dressmaker who lived on Beresford Avenue, a similar area to where Mira lived in the Avenues area near Pearson's Park and Chantelands Avenue in West Hull. Eileen described Winnie as being really nice to her, taking her under her wing. Cycling the short 10 minutes down Beverly Road into work, perhaps the reason she wore trousers, she made a bridesmaid's dress for Eileen when she got married, who said she was the best dressmaker ever. But number 11 was someone who again left her with a question that lasted over the years. Ethel Duffin got on perfectly well with Eileen while they were both in the workroom, but Eileen felt she blanked her years later when they bumped into each other in the Hornsey Pottery, a famous ceramics business in the seaside town on the coast. With lots of sisters and now married to a teacher, Ethel's father was a skipper on the trawlers, a job with status in the fishing industry and all over the city as well. Eileen had what she called rich relations, the Rawsons, and were very successful farmers, but she was upset by the slight, as we all would be ourselves, perhaps happening because Ethel didn't want to be reminded of her own working past after she got married and left the workroom, I feel, rather than her not liking Eileen or not seeing her as she walked around in another space like the workrooms they occupied. We've mentioned in the showroom talks that Hull and the Surrounds had a hierarchy with people like the later Sir Basil and Maisie Parks, his wife, treated like local royalty. Memories of the time Mirelle was open from the people who worked, shopped there or knew Hull emphasise the atmosphere of exclusivity and the sort of woman who shopped there fed into its success Perhaps that brushed off on some members of staff more than others, creating a feeling of superiority, making clothes or altering them for such well-known, often very wealthy people with lots of influence, was like having made for the royals, mixing with knowing they were employed in what was considered to be the second best workroom in Hull. But maybe you think differently about that. Let us know in the comments below.
The final lady with the turban wrapped round her head wearing a jumper and trousers was Jean Broughton, known as Big Jean, a bit like the Valeries were known as Big and Little Val, which you'll hear about in the showroom videos. A friend of Ethel's who liked to go dancing together, Jean sadly died of cancer, said Eileen, much later on in life, which goes to show how firm the friendships were that were made around the large workroom table and how in Hull, known as the biggest village in Yorkshire by the locals, people stayed in touch bumped into each other or heard what was happening after they left work along its very lively social network that lasts in the warm and friendly atmosphere and culture of the modern hull of today. What a tale this picture tells much more than first meets the eye. We can see that in 1946 it was a large workroom with 12 members of staff round the table and job adverts we'll look at in a separate video show more people worked outside the workroom from their homes as well. It was probably one of the largest in the area competing with those in Madame Clapham, Hammond's, Thornton Varley's department store as well as H.N. Salter's on Wright Street which we mentioned in an earlier workroom video and later on when she joined Mirelle because her training workplace at Salter's closed in 1956, Brenda Foots, who was in the workroom in the 50s said, Clapham first, Mirelle second, meaning there was also a hierarchy of workrooms in the city at this time and with a reputation to match and to work at the house of Mirelle was almost like saying you were working at the court dressmakers although the work was not as detailed or time consuming at the house of Mirelle. The workroom girls talk throughout its lifetime of the numerous deadlines they had to accommodate, especially when the Hull Fair was in town, but more about that later. If you're liking stories like these and want to know more, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon. The photo that Brenda took of the workroom girls outside Story Street in 1957 tells another story of the styles of the era as well as the changing face of who was staffing the workroom then. But before we look at that in another video and we finish, do you think the girls knew the importance of this photo when it was taken and fashion detectives? Where do you think the workroom girls got the clothes they're wearing and which ones stand out for you? Let us know in the comments below.